maybe before our preacher starts, uh, let's have a special prayer to pray for the preacher. Uh, I know there are so many members of the prayer band in our midst. Can we be praying for you? Yes, the Lord uses there. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you because you are a God of mercy. There are people here who have come by faith. They are not well physically, but they know that they are coming to meet you. That's why they are here, and they are expecting a healing. There are people who are here who are discouraged because this is not an easy country to live in. They are here because they know that you are going to encourage them. And here is your servant, uh, Dr. Black. I want to present you into your hands. Father, may you use you. Some of us have had you. You have used you before in a mighty way. But I pray that today, may you descend again. We don't want to see her. We want to see you. Something must happen today. And somebody must be saved. And someone must recommit their life to you. We want to thank you because soon and very soon we will go home. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Well, good morning and a blessed Sabbath to all here this, this day. A blessed Sabbath. Amen. Uh, amen, amen. I'm standing here and I'm sensing my own complete nothingness. It is for me an awesome privilege just to stand in the presence of God's people. You know, there are times when we take things for granted. And sometimes we think we have arrived because of the blessings of God. For me, I'm humbled that the team under the leadership, I believe, of Elder Martin would have chosen to ask me to share this awesome weekend with you. So I can't take it for granted and think there's something about me why I was asked to be here has nothing to do with me, but we give all praise to the Almighty King. Amen. I want to thank your team, Elder Martin, and all those who are part of making this weekend what it is for the opportunity you have given to me at a worship with you and to experience the moving of God, I count it indeed a privilege. I'm blessed by the singing. I was sitting in the back and I was moved to tears. I couldn't understand a word. <laughs> but the sound of music was a sweet sound to mine own heart. And I just could not help but imagine the day when we shall see Jesus. Amen. And the sound of music and praise that will be in heaven. I'm looking forward to being there. 
Young people, thank you for your ministry. There were some men who sang last evening, last night, yes, last evening. I mean, those men are off the chain too, you know. They're good. And our youth, young men and women, who have committed yourself to use your voices for God, don't take it for granted. Always know that every time you stand in the midst of God's people, it's an awesome privilege. We praise God for his mercy. I know we are on a time crunch, and I'm a long talker, so I'm still praying that the Lord will give me the wisdom to know how to stop talking. And so until I gain that, I need to start so we could get out of here. Amen. Amen. Won't you bow your heads with me? In this moment, this very moment, oh God, the stillness of the things that are secular, can we have paused from the everyday mundane things in this moment? We pray, God, that your presence would be mighty in this place. Your spirit would be manifested and your name be glorified as you speak through me to us. Let Jesus be lifted up. Let your people be drawn closer to you. We give you thanks as you have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. We will read, hmm, let's see. One through six. Isaiah chapter six, one through six. Can I invite us to stand as we together read the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are we there? Are we together? Are we ready? Amen. Let's begin. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train filled with temples. The, the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the host of the Amen. You may be seated. For many of us, it's a well familiar passage. But let me give a little background on the king of whom Isaiah told us that in the year that he died, he saw the Lord. It has been said that there had been, never had been rather another king like King Hosea since Solomon. It has been said 
never had the national pride of God's people been so great or the nation's dream of sovereignty reached so far since Solomon. One writer stated that God helped King Hosea and made him to prosper and his name spread abroad and he was marvelously helped till he was strong. He was a distinctively progressive king. He was a king of action and enterprise. He was successful in foreign policy and wise in domestic affairs. Under his reign, the nation of Judah prospered. He was loved by his people, but feared by his enemies. <laughs> With all the graces of this ideal king, he became the pillar of the nation's hope, the storehouse of the people's trust, the ultimate security of their prosperity. And so the people invested in this king their admiration. Somewhere in all their successes and accomplishments, it would appear that the people placed their eyes on the king and lost sight of God. They became strongly indisposed to obedience of the sacred covenant. The people of God became so entangled in heathen religions that the sins of willfulness in religion flowed through Judah like mighty rivers. They had forgotten who had given them the victory. They took their eyes off God. They had become so successful and prosperous, they began to believe that they were all that and more. That even God himself brought a charge against his own people. When you read Isaiah chapter 1, you will hear God bringing this charge against his people. In verses 2 to 4, we hear him say, Hear, O heavens, and give air, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master. The donkey knows its master's crib. But Israel, my people, does not consider all oh, awful and sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. The Bible tells us that God has said that even dumb animals knew their master better than God's people knew their creator. It was a time of spiritual, <laughs> blatant spiritual decline. Do you see a similarity in our day? From right across the world, whether it's here, Europe, or in the Americas, or in Australia, or in Africa, we see the spiritual decline right across the board. Sin, unrestrained, unchecked, has developed in increasing tidal waves of wickedness, not only in the world, but in the church. Have mercy, somebody. Volcanoes of iniquity spewing out the ruins of decayed spirituality, covering Christianity with a muck and miasma of Sodom and Gomorrah. In our churches. <laughs> There is no distinction between the holy and the unholy. There is no distinction between the sacred and the common. Everything right now is as it goes. Whatever I want it to be, so it is. The word of God is now not as important as it used to right now. It is what I think is right within the church. 
with the increase and growth of false religions and anti-religious thinking, we have lost sight of God. No greater time of danger has come up on the church as it is right now in the present. It has been said that when Christianity retreats, evil steps in to fill the gap. And truly, it seems as though with all the evil that is going on around us, that Christianity has retreated. So it was in the days of the king, in the days of God's people. And so the Bible tells us that the king was stricken with leprosy, isolated, and after a while he died. The death of the king was indeed a public tragedy. You see, all their hopes were centered in this great king. So I can just imagine that the prophet must have feared for the nation. The death of the king means that the core of this nation's life would topple over into confusion and a disaster. It means that there was a crisis that would be certain that chaos was anticipated. But the Bible said that the prophet, in the day that the king died, that the prophet, sometime within that year, the prophet of God went into the temple and the prophet declared that I saw the Lord also. In the place of crisis, he saw God. In the place of chaos, there emerged the Lord of order. Are you listening to me? I don't know what he was going through or what the prophet was expecting to happen. But the Bible said that he saw also the Lord. It means that he saw other things around him. He saw the chaos. He saw the tears. He saw the sorrow. But in the midst of all the pain and in the midst of all the mourning, the prophet said, I went into the temple in the year that the, Lord, the, the king had died and I saw the Lord. The veil had had been removed and the prophet saw what was hidden behind the veil. In the year that King Hosiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. He had anticipated that things were coming to an end but he went into the temple and he saw a new beginning for he saw a greater kingdom with a greater king. If the throne of Judah had not been emptied, the prophet would not have seen the throne of God in heaven. God had to remove the king of earth in order for the prophet to see the God of heaven. The central truth is this. God is always and always will be the king of kings. You see, the human king is dead, but the king of kings is still sitting on his throne. <laughs> Earthly powers fade and perish, but the eternal power lives on. Whatever the circumstances of your life, know that there is a God who is still king of kings and lord of lords sitting on his throne. We may be sometimes become distracted by the circumstances of life, the ups and the downs of life, the pain and the sorrows of life the losses of life we will become distracted sometimes frightened by economic instability and political unrest but know and understand that the ultimate security of all national greatness is not kings and crowns but God himself understand that it doesn't matter what happens with our economy it doesn't matter what happens with world peace nothing is for fundamental except that God is still God. The eternal center of all life, the center which time cannot weaken and death cannot corrupt is not King Hosea it's not in the circumstances of our lives. It's not in the things that are distracting us from God. The center of all things rests in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Are you listening to me this morning? You see, earthly king, 
the earthly king has somehow come between God and the people. And somehow they place their trust in man. And oftentimes as a people, we take our eyes off God and place our trust in man. We believe man more than we believe God. We trust man more than we believe God. We give man more of our time, more of our resources than we give to God. Oftentimes we find ourselves losing our hold upon God because we are holding on to mankind. The earthly king had come between the prophet and his God. And it was only when the earthly king was taken away that the prophet declared that I saw the Lord high and lifted up sitting on a throne. I just want you to know that sometimes, sometimes in the life that we live here on earth, we allow the things of earth to block our vision and to dull our senses of who Jesus is. But God will not be competed with. And so God will sometimes have to move things and people out of our lives in order for us to see Jesus. You see, God never empties our places in our lives without ready to fill them. He empties us that he might fill us. Are you listening to me? Sometimes the losses we suffer, the sorrows we carry, the disappointments we endure, the pain we feel are actually meant by God to prepare us for the vision, to see a vision of God. You see, changing things, when things change in our lives, those things should allow us to see the unchanging God standing clear near and dear unto us changes are not to get us down changes are not are not to get us to give up on God give up on church changes are to let us see the unchanging God closer to us the Bible said it was in the time that Isaiah was mourning in the year that the king died that Isaiah saw Jesus Sometimes, God will have to remove us out of our place. Sometimes, God will have to take the king out of our lives in order for us to give attention to him. Sometimes, he will allow us to suffer disappointments. Sometimes, he will allow us to suffer failure even so in order for us to give back our attention to him. Sometimes because we have allowed the things of earth to come between us and our God, God will strip us in order for us to give attention to him. But one thing I know is that this great God will not take something from us without giving us something back. The Bible said that in the year that King Uzziah died, the prophet saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Now, what catch my attention with the text? And this is what I really want us to kind of get this morning. We know the text. We understand the text. We have heard it before. We've heard sermons on it before. But I don't want us to miss this. Now, the Bible said, and we're talking about revival. Now, the Bible said in verse 2 that when Isaiah saw the Lord, Sitting on his throne, above the throne stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. They used two to cover their faces. Two to cover his feet. And two to fly. The seraphims six wings. Six wings. Two of the wings are used to fly. Now I'm thinking that flying may symbolize service. 
So, if my assumption is correct in the text, that flying may simply symbolize a service, or even if that's not what it symbolizes, but let's use it for the sake of argument. Are you with me? They use two for service. Two to work in the church. Two to spread the message of the gospel. Two to tell folks about Jesus. Two to do good things for people. They use two. Six wings. Two used for service. And the Bible said... That with four, they covered themselves. They covered their faces. They covered their feet. <laughs> Suggesting reverence. Talking about revival. That's what we are saying, revival, so Lord. Six wings, two for service, and four for covering of themselves, suggesting reverence in the presence of God. The angels in heaven who minister before God Use two wings to go about their duty and four to cover themselves. Let me repeat myself in a different way. Sinless angels, talking about revival, in the presence of God, sinless angels who served above the throne of God use four wings to cover themselves in the presence of God. Sinless angels cannot endure the full glory and majesty of God. They who have never sinned covered themselves in the presence of God. I'm talking about needing a revival. And sinless human beings. Would enter the place where they declare that the presence of God is naked. Angels. When Isaiah entered the temple, angels who were sinless in the temple, who stood the throne in the presence of God use four wings to cover themselves in the presence of holiness yet we who are sinful would enter the courts of God dressed anyhow. If sinless angels find God so awesome that they covered themselves, then why is it that we who are sinful find it so comfortable to come in the presence of God, Jesus? Uncovered with all kind of body parts exposing, or so casually 
with our casual conversations. Walk in the presence of God, in the house, in the temple, in the church, that we have declared that therein is the presence of God, that sinful beings would come into the house of God so casually. Living anyhow. Behaving anyhow. Speaking anyhow. We enter into his presence. As though it is a common restroom. And the sad part of it is that we all get offended when we begin to dress, address rather, Lifestyles in the presence of God. Because we have told ourselves that God will accept anything no matter what it is. So you know what we say? Come as you are. And you are right. Because we cannot change ourselves. So we must come as we are. But how dare we come as we are and expect to remain just as we are. You see, I'm told that God does not save us in sin, but God save us from our sin. God does not save us and leave us the way that he found us. God save us and move us to a new level in Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear that by beholding, we are changed into the image of God from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. The same Bible tells us that we have been once this old man but when we come to know Jesus, all the things are passed away. Amen. We're talking about revival. And we have to be real if we're really talking about we want to be revived. Unless we are just saying it for saying its sake. Angels who have never sinned. <laughs> Veiled their faces, covered their feet. <laughs> and sinful humanity. Enter his presence, dressed, behaving, living anyhow, and expect to give a holy God worship. If we're really serious about heaven, young and old, if we're really serious about God and heaven, we've got to begin to think of what we are doing when we come into the presence of God. There is a line that is drawn and God will not accept anything anyhow. We want to be revealed.
revived, then it means that we've got to begin to examine ourselves and see really how do we look at God? What do we know about him? What do we really want? Is it that we want to escape hell? Because if that's all there is to it, then we will never live right. But if it is about Jesus, then something has to change. We can't just give what we want when we want or how we want. It is not left up to us how to worship God. He alone dictates the terms of worship. The Bible says, when the prophet saw the vision, the angels veiled themselves in the presence of a holy God. And not only did they veil themselves, the Bible said they cried, holy, holy. They cried. Because they understood that God alone is holy. And as they cried, the foundations of the threshold or the doorpost were moved at the voice of the angels. And they cried that the house was filled with smoke. For the glory of the Lord has filled the earth. They cried holy. The Bible said their faces were covered. <laughs> you would have expected that with covered faces, you would not hear the sound coming from the angels. You'd have expected that somehow, if your face is covered, the sound would be muffled. But not so. Instead, the Bible said that the voices ring out with sound of praise, that the very post of the temple quivered, and even the prophet's heart stirred to its depth, that he became disturbed at his own condition. The impact of the vision of God's holiness, presence, and glory moved the prophet to cry, Woe is me! He came! In the presence of God. And the consciousness of God's presence uh, resulted uh, in the prophet being aware of his own sinfulness. He is the prophet. You would have expected that a prophet was sinless. Jesus. But it is the prophet that cried, woe is me. In the presence of God, he became aware of his own sinfulness. If you read the stories throughout the Bible, you would notice that this is a kind of reaction on the part of any person who became aware of God's presence without exception when they came into the presence of holiness. You notice Moses, when he encountered God's presence, he was moved with fear. He removed the shoes from off his feet because the ground on which he was standing was holy. We listen to Job in chapter 42 of Job when he he cried out, I've heard of you, but now I've seen you, and now because I've seen you, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. It is the same thing of Peter in Luke chapter 5, 8, when he saw what Jesus really was and who Jesus really is. The Bible said that Peter fell on his knees and said, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. In Revelation 1:17. It is told that John, when he came in the presence of the mighty angel, the king of kings, that he fell at his feet as dead men, for he recognized that there is holiness. The normal reaction of anyone who is 
in the presence of God and is conscious that they are in the presence of God is a humbling of themselves and a recognition of their own sinfulness. Folks, let, 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 me, let me say this, let me say this, let me say this. We have been week after week entering into the most holy the sanctuary entering into the church the temple the service the worship we walk in we sit down we are unconscious of God's presence yet we say we are worshiping God. To be conscious of God's presence is to recognize our own sinfulness. And if I am not recognizing my own sinfulness, if I am still content with what I am, and I'll come to church and say I worship and leave the same way I came, something is wrong. Why do we come week after week? Why do we sacrifice the time when we could be out there doing everything else and we are here saying we are worshiping, but indeed it is not God that we have given worship to? How could it be that God is in the place And we have not encountered him. The Bible said, when the prophet saw and heard, recognized, he was in the presence of holiness. He trembled in fear and cried, woe is me. I am a man of sinfulness. I am undone. And I dwell in the midst of a sinful people. In the presence of God, the prophet had a deep sense of personal sinfulness. He saw himself measured by God's standard. He stood there. He stood there and he listened as the angels rang out the sound of praise. And he could not mingle his own polluted praise with the worship of that pure sinless host of heaven. For his breath was tainted by his own sin. He stood there. On the threshold of heaven, in sight, in full sight of God and his holiness, dumb and praiseless. Oh, Jesus, now I understand when we come to church and we cannot even open our mouth to praise God, that the problem is just the fact that we are messed up. He stood there. While heaven rings out and vibrates with praise and worship of God, he, the creator, he stood there and could not give praise to his own creator. Because in the presence of holiness, he became mute. He stood in his own way, too wicked to worship. And all around them, the Bible said, were wicked. Couldn't worship. Couldn't give praise to his creator. Because of the sinfulness of his own life. It seemed to Isaiah as if the light and glory and holiness of heaven we're gathering into one fierce lightning fire of vengeance to overwhelm and crush him. He cried out, 
Woe is me, for I am undone. When was the last time we have felt the presence of God that moves us to cry, I am undone? Woe is me. When was the last time? Have we entered into a worship service and felt our own sinfulness that we bow down in complete humility and cry out, God, save me. If you don't, I'm dead. Like Israel, who had become satisfied with their religion. So God's people today have become satisfied with mere church attendance. Believe in somehow that we are okay and God should accept whatever lifestyle you live. Whatever service you give. I'm convinced. That we need a fresh vision of God. I'm convinced that only a spiritual vision of God. Will help us to sense our nothingness before God. There can and will be no revival of moral sensibilities and powers. Without a fresh vision of God. We've got to come face to face with this eternal God. In order to understand that God alone is holy. The passions and the intellect and the imagination and the emotions may move in church services. And have we not seen it? How we get up at sermons and we cry hallelujah. We get all emotional. We praise God. Yay! Hallelujah. We sing and we praise. But then the service is over and sin takes over. We've been there. I've been there, moved by the emotions. (laughs) Had a good time in service because the singing was on the chain. was good. Hmm? The preaching, oh man, I shout hallelujah all day in the preaching. But after it was over, it did nothing to change you. I'm convinced there's ever going to be a revival. We need to have a fresh awareness of the character of God. For that alone will bring us a deep sense of personal sinfulness and spiritual insufficiency. We are too content in our sinfulness. Are you listening to me? We are too content in our sinful state. We are too happy to, oh Jesus, too satisfied with where we are. And we see no need to change. We know that things are not right. We know that things are not what they ought to be. We know that we are not saved. But we are satisfied. As a people, as a people from Britain to America to Jamaica to Trinidad to Zimbabwe, Yay, South Africa, you name it. As a people, we are plagued with the outward profession of religiousness. 
and a readiness to comply with the ceremonial demands of a faith that cannot discern the presence of barren formalism and hypocrisy. It almost seems as though we believe that we are doing God a favor when we attend church and participate in some church program, return tithe and offering. We think we are doing God a favor. Our most desperate need. In this day. Is a spiritual and moral revival. That is our most desperate need. It has been too long since we've been going through the motions. It's been too long. Since we have been going through the motions. This was not what we used to be. There was a time when Adventists arrogant about what we believe. We made no excuse to anybody. And when they ask us what we believe, we say it with pride. And we were bold and arrogant about it. Because we knew it was the truth. We understood. There were things that we would dare not allow to be a part of our service. There was a time. But it seemed as if the time has slipped by. And now anything goes in the church of God and in the lives of God's people. There has never been a more serious time in the history of this church for a revival of spiritual godliness. Young and old alike. We often look at the young people and say the young people ain't living up. No, they ain't living up because we have not lived up. We blame the youth. You heard it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's their fault why the church is the way that the church is. No, it's not their fault. Never was and never will be. The older ones who ought to have set the example did not live up. And the truth that should have been passed on did not get passed on the way that it should. Instead of teaching doctrines of Bible, we have began to teach the traditions of men. There is a text, Judges, a text I believe is Judges 2, and it declared that after Joshua and the elders that were with him had passed off the sea, there rose up another generation which knew not God, nor the things of God, and they worshipped the Baal. They worship the Baal because what Joshua knew and the elders that were with him knew, somehow it got lost in transition. And so a generation rose up after them which did not know the acts of God, nor what God did to bring them out. So it is in our church today that our generation today do not know how God brought this church <laughs> into existence. We have lost out on our history as a people. I remember the days <laughs> we used to say, we are the remnant. <laughs> and 
now you're getting beat down if we say that. Because now everybody is the remnant. No distinction. The foundational doctrines of the church have now become irrelevant. Because they're a list of do's and don'ts. And it's too much don't. And it's too much don't. Not realizing that the commandments are don'ts. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Every doctrine. All 28 doctrines. Those fundamental beliefs uh, that we think are old and relevant, uh, irrelevant rather, all of them uh, come strictly from scripture. They did not just come about uh, out of man's mind. Uh, men searched scriptures and they came up with those as the summary of what we believe as a people. To move away from those fundamental doctrines, we have moved away from the things that God has brought this church and founded this church on. Our doctrines no longer relevant. So I'm convinced. So I'm convinced that we are in a more serious time than a need for revival. We need not only a corporate Revival as a church, but an individual resurgent of God consciousness and moral righteousness. Now the lines are blurred. For now many of us don't even know if it's wrong or right when it comes to certain lifestyles. The lines are blurred. Because sin isn't sin anymore. And God isn't serious about giving over those who turn to one another like themselves, men to men, women to women, and to a reprobate mind because they've forgotten about the creator. The creator. Oh, now we don't even know if that's right anymore for times of change. So God must have changed. Listen to me. Listen to me. We have migrated from a place we call Africa, the motherland. The West didn't bring God to Africa. Africa knew about God long before the West came. You knew God. God was embedded in your heart and your spirit. You came to this country of plenty. And somehow the successes and prosperity has caused us to lose sight of God and the things of God. And we have slipped away from that which we know to be true. And the doctrines that we hold dear are no longer relevant to us. And now we begin to think differently. I just want us to know that holiness is not uh, an ethical quantity or quality. Holiness is the essence of God's nature. Separate and utterly removed from the profane. God is calling us to holiness. We need a vision of God, for it is only a vision of God that will ever strike terror in the unholy and the proud and bring us to all and reverence in the fear of God. We need a vision of God. God has not changed. He is still holy. He is still holy. Are you listening to me? He did not change, has not changed, and never will change. He is still <laughs> the same unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, unattainable God. Yet, 
condescended to meet man on his level, Jesus. It is the cross that stands as a supreme example of God's holiness. For there we see divine holiness displayed on a hill called Calvary. It is because of God's holiness why Christ had to die. For holiness demands that there must be justice for sin. There is no way that we can make it the way that some of us are. There is no way, my son. My brother, there is no way that we are going to make it the way that we are living right now. There is no way. For if there was a way to do it, then Jesus would not have died. Or his death is in vain. The glory of divine holiness was enshrined on Calvary when a priest who needed not to offer sacrifice for his own sins for he was holy and undefiled appeared and there made himself a sacrifice for sinful mankind. On Calvary those softened by the veil of humanity through which it was revealed, the holiness of God beamed forth with an intensity that rendered it once at once the most beautiful and sublime display of God's holiness that has ever been displayed. Holiness demanded that a life must be given. And Jesus, the son of the living God, decided that he would pay the price to satisfy justice. That the holiness of God may reach out to mankind. And we are comfortable. 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 Just living, expecting to make it to the kingdom. Listen to me. I bless God that in his holiness, he is a forgiving God. For the text says, but when the prophet cried out, Oh, yes, me. For I am undone. I am a man of sinful lips. But an angel one up a seraph went to the altar of God. And there it took a life called from off the altar. And the Bible said, uh, he touched the lips of the prophet. The pity and holiness of God stoops forgivingly to sinful men and graciously forgive and accept the sinful man. I want you to know today that it doesn't matter how bad we are. There is a God who sits on the throne of heaven who is still willing to forgive and to cleanse. Blessed be the name of God. We don't have to be lost. None of us have to be lost. For the provision has been made. God has made it on Calvary. The Bible says that God is willing to take away our sins and cast them into the depth of the sea. 
He's ready to forgive. That's why I love the song. I love the song. As I bring this thing to a close, I love the song. It says, there's a covenant sweet. It was written for me. Oh, I wish I had somebody who could sing this for me. There's a covenant sweet. It was written for me. It's a promise that I could be, be free from all my sin and my shame. Even heartache and pain. It was signed and confirmed on a hill. So don't feel sorry for me. When you see I'm in need. There's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts. All my sins he forgives. Every trial is won through the blood. So I rest my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified. I've been satisfied. Oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. So in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Doesn't matter how far we have gone. It doesn't matter how bad God's people are. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. There is still a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt to stay. Holiness still matters. Holiness still matters. We need a revival. We need a revival. Moral righteousness. God consciousness. We need to be revived. We cannot continue the way we are. Slowly slipping away. Thinking that we are okay. And in the end be lost. We've heard too many sermons. Attended too many churches. Worked too hard for God. To be cast away. We will not... For many of us, including me, make it just the way we are. I'm glad that God is not done with me yet. Because even though I'm not what I used to be, I know that I'm not what I ought to be. So I'm so glad that the paint is still in, the brush is still in the master's hand. That's it for me today. What about? What about you? I know we want to make it. We want to make it. We need to make it. We must make it. But there has to be a change for many of us. As I often say, as Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous. So I'm not talking to those who are okay. If you are okay, you're okay. But those who need to be revived, who need to be restored, who need to turn to God, to you I'm speaking. It don't matter those who are around you. You know your own heart. You know your lifestyle. You know how you have been living. You know the condition of your life. You know how far you have slipped or how close you have drawn to God, you know. So just between you and God today, nobody else, what is the state of your relationship with God? Have you catch a new glimpse of the holiness of his character? What is the condition the state of your relationship with God. If you know you're not in the best of place, if you know you need God to turn you to Him, if you know 
that you're in a desperate need for revival, then I invite you to stand with me. There's a habit that we have. That when the appeal is made, and we're asked to stand, we all stand because everybody's standing. So I don't want to feel left out. I don't want you to stand because everybody's standing. I want you to make a decision to stand because you know. You know between you and God. You're not where you need to be. There may be somebody who has slipped away. Life has changed. Things have changed. Church has changed. And even though you may still go, you have slipped away. I want to invite you to come home. If that's you, just lift your hand wherever you are. So lift your hand. I see your hand. You have slipped. Listen to me carefully. I don't want you to raise your hand just for the sake of doing it. Listen to me. You used to be completely sold out to God. But maybe Things in your life, circumstances have changed. Church has changed. And you have slipped away. You may still go. Maybe once in a while. Maybe not at all. But the connection is not there as it used to. You want to make a decision today to say, God, no more. I'm coming home. Lift your hand wherever you are. I see your hand. I see them. I see them. I need to meet with you personally. That room, as soon as the service is over, I know we're rushing to lunch, but if you meet with me for two minutes, I'll tell you what I need from you. For those of you who raise your hand, don't slip away. Don't raise them, and when I need you or you're not there, just come meet me for two minutes. It's just me, you, and God. Is that all right? Two minutes. Pastor, we're going to invite you to come and pray for us. Pray. Pray. There will be a freshness of God's power in our lives. Pray especially for those who raise their hands. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you because your spirit is here. And I want to thank you because your word is alive. And you have mentioned it in your word, that when your word is spoken, it is like a two-edged sword. And I want to thank you for the people that you have reached this afternoon. We thank you for the invitation from the cross that come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I want you, Lord, to be with those people we have raised up their hands. May you give them a new beginning. May you bless them. And we want to thank you for your people who are standing before you. Father, we just want to thank you for visiting us today. We don't want this to be just the feelings only. But may it be a new beginning. We thank you because of your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen.